What's engaged in a conspiracy against all civilization? My Catholic Church! This is Behind the Bastards, a podcast that focuses on the evils of the false pope in Rome. We are, of course, devotees of the anti-pope Novatian, um, who carried out a, a righteous rebellion against the power of Pope Cornelius in the in the mid 200s. Um, you know, God rest his soul. Uh, James, what's the what's the the chief thing you've learned from the anti pope? Uh, I don't know. His his input on uh, on hair and skincare has been really important to me. Yeah, yeah. He had, he had a lot to say about that in the mm-hmm. Latin language, uh, which yep. he was the first Roman theologian to use. Um, I'm just learning about him now on Wikipedia. I don't know why I went with this as the introduction for the Nobody episode. Knows, uh, Nobody, Nobody knows, Robert. Yeah. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody knows. No. But you know what? This is now a podcast dedicated to the anti-pope Novation, who lived from 280 to 258. Wow. Yeah, well, it's a big change from our last episode, which was, uh, of course, dedicated to a dead groundhog, so... That's right. That's right. They have a lot in common. Mm-hmm. Uh, the anti-pope and that ground hog that built Blasio. <laughs> did, did Bill de Blasio drop the anti-pope <laughs> on his brain? Just as well. an incredible I'm piece gonna, of information but, uh, you gave us, yeah, James. Yeah, I'm going to make yeah. one more request from the artists to our fans, which is a uh, like a like a, a, <laughs> a, a Roman a, a, a Roman style relief, like the ceiling of the uh, uh, of Sistine the Vatican. Chapel. That's like yeah. That's like. Anti Pope Novation and that fucking groundhog <laughs> holding hands in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Press the <Jeez>. power kings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Do it as Hero's a mural. Soul. Find a building. Yeah. It doesn't matter who owns it. Draw mm-hmm. that as a mural, and uh, we yeah. will send you a t shirt. Let those two kings be the symbol of our next revolution. <laughs> Hand in paw. <laughs> the anti pope riding into battle on a, de- <laughs> dead <laughs> on a groundhog. Squashed groundhog. <laughs> Finally, de Blasio will get his, his comeuppance. <laughs> so. Speaking of Bill de Blasio, the first official Nazi party outside of Germany was formed in Paraguay in 1927 under a mango tree in the capital. While Forster, that anti-Semitic philosopher we talked about last time, had been a miserable failure in his goal of creating an Aryan sanctuary, his published writings traveled across the world and became kind of a a leading light for several generations of German anti-Semites. One of these anti-Semites was a guy you might have heard of named Adolf Hitler. Um, he comes across Forster's readings as a young man, and he he reveres them so much that when he comes to power, he sends a bunch of German soil over to Paraguay so that local Nazis can cover Forster's grave. He also allegedly sends along a tombstone plaque with the words, the place where the father of Nazism lies inscribed upon it. Um, now, there's... Yeah. If we have any listeners in Paraguay, that's a great thing to tag. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a nice thing to destroy. Um, yeah, yeah. There is Put some a groundhog on it. Yeah, groundhog that fucker. Do, do yeah. the, give it the old Bill de Blasio treatment and drop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, drop there's, there is debate over whether or not Hitler is the person who sent this plaque, but the plaque does exist. Uh, British historian Ben McIntyre is one of the people who considers it, it likely that Hitler would have said this. Obviously, that doesn't mean that he was like the only ideological father of Nazism. Hitler Hitler could be a flatterer when he wanted to be. But it does, there is, it, like, it is kind of beyond arguing that Hitler was a, a fan of this guy, and that Forster influenced his attitudes. Um, as a result of all this, it is perhaps not surprising that Nazism held an allure to some segments of the Paraguayan populace. The nation's first national police director named his son Adolfo, and demanded police cadets wear swastikas on their uniforms. <laughs> 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 oh, this is this is a post nineteen forty five swastika, right? No, no, no. These are pre forty five, okay, post thirty okay, three, though. Yeah. Okay. Still, still probably a poor decision. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Did he then say it's just a Buddhist symbol, bro? Or uh, yeah, yeah. Standard. It means stuff. peace. <laughs> <laughs> it's all um, in time. Yeah. Now Paraguay also speaking of bad decisions, sided with the Nazis in World War Two. Initially, um, so they kind of switch their allegiances midway through the war when it's like, uh, you know what? <laughs> Look, Paraguay's got a history of being on the wrong side of wars. We don't want to risk that this time. 
<laughs> um, and obviously also, like, it doesn't really matter what side of World War II Paraguay was on. They are a landlocked country in South America. Yeah. They're not going to play a role in the fighting. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the the government, though, uh, the Paraguayan government does switch their allegiances right before the end. Uh, it is worth noting that the Paraguayan Nazi Party refuses to give up the ghost until 1946. So Paraguay's Nazi Party lasts longer than the original one. That's a uh, <laughs> great, <laughs> at least later. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, well done then. After the war, this tiny landlocked nation seemed like an enticing new home to dozens of former SS men and other fascist war criminals. Paraguay already had a modest German-speaking population based around Mennonite colonists, um, but it was also full of, and this kind of made it less desirable, it was also a place where a lot of white Russian officers had fled, um, some of whom okay. had helped out in the Chaco War. These guys, some of them didn't like the fascists. Some of them were always, were also very sympathetic to the Nazis because like, you know, Stalin and the white Russians, not, not a, not a, not a great mix. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So on what? the whole, this is, huh? Fucking white Russians end up everywhere. Like, I've recently been on a kick about reading uh, mm -hmm. about white Russians in the Spanish civil war who end up like, yeah. all over the international brigades. It, it, yeah. yeah. And a, lo a lot of these guys are, Czarists, a lot of these guys are fascists. A lot of these guys are the kinds of czarists that are basically fascists. In any case, it's a nice place to be a Nazi after World War II, Paraguay. So Nazis sure. start filtering in there. A lot of them settle with Mennonites. Uh, at least one Mennonite community adopts a pro-Nazi school curricula for its children as a result of this. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't speak that shit into reality because Ron yeah. DeSantis will be all over it. Yeah, fucking mini Nazis, Jesus. <laughs> Others simply took Nazi money. <laughs> to be money fair, and, if they'd yeah. uh, if they'd all been Mennonites, and we probably mm. wouldn't have had quite so many issues with them. No, no. Just Although, logically speaking, yeah, they uh, they. I mean, they already mostly did shit on horseback anyway. Um, as as illustrated in in probably the best scene of Band of Brothers. Um, God, that show did a lot right. Um. There's this great scene where like a bunch of American soldiers are like riding in after kind of the Nazi regime collapses and they see all these like German POWs hauling shit on horses while they're on the back of a Jeep and they're like fucking horses. Like you <laughs> thought you could win this war and you've got fucking horses. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> it's very funny. Um, so, yeah, these Nazis start winding up all over the fucking place and they decide like, you know what? Paraguay would be great for is a smuggling base for Odessa, the organization of former SS men who helped each other smuggle themselves into other countries in order to avoid prosecution for doing a Holocaust. Now, some of my sources will argue that like Stressner was the kind of guy who wasn't really ideologically committed to much of anything other than being in power. Um, but that's also essentially the I ideology of a lot of surviving Nazi officials. So Stressner and the Nazis got along pretty well. And there are some allegations, most notably from Alex Shumatov, that Stressner was at least Nazi curious. Shumatov basically claims that in his early life, Stressner had little contact with Germans in Paraguay, but that this changed in his 30s. And he kind of became a Germanophile, you know, getting in touch with his dad's people. I'm going to quote from Vanity Fair again here. One of Stressner's German buddies was Hans Rudel, a flying ace in the Luftwaffe who flew more missions than anyone, destroyed a cruiser, a battleship, 519 Russian tanks, was shot down twice, lost his right leg below the calf, but continued to excel at tennis and water skiing, was the idol <laughs> of the post-war German right, the embodiment of Aryan perfection. Hitler created a special medal with him, the Knight's Cross with golden oak leaves. After the war, he tried out planes for the Argentinian government, and when Perón fell in 1955, was given asylum by his friend Stressner when Argentina was no longer safe for ex-Nazis. Rudel went to Paraguay as well and worked in the Ferreta Paraguaya in Asuncion, selling BMWs, telephones, cement, and iron. He also worked for Odessa. So, he's like he's like a BMW dealer who's smuggling not yeah. the Waffen SS yeah, yeah. out of Europe and into Argentina. It's like the Forrest Gump of Nazis here. He just pays yeah. all the high points. It's the Eastern yeah. Front fucking Argentina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's all over the fucking place, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to selling used cars. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> gotta have a side hustle. Stressner and Rudel become fast friends, and working with Rudel, Stressner sets up a system whereby new passports and visas can be sold for an exorbitant price, of which he got a cut, to old Nazis. And one of the Nazis who takes advantage of this very forgiving Paraguayan government policy is another fella you might have heard of, Dr. Joseph Mengele. 
So oh good, glad, <laughs> good. He's, glad that oh, fucker good. showed up. Good, Mangle yeah, great. Right. Yeah, Just, <laughs> so I was looking forward to that this Friday yeah. afternoon. Yeah. So if you if you're not up on your Mangala, the kind of cliff's notes of this guy is that he's a doctor at Auschwitz who performs fatal experiments on 1500 sets of twin children. Um, he did shit like inject colored eye into like the eyes of toddlers, uh, colored dye into the eyes of toddlers who were twins to like see if it affected the other twin. It was like nonsense. It was it was crazy nonsense. That's <laughs> Dr. Joseph Mengele. <laughs> yeah. He's a terrible person. We will cover him at some point. He's one of those guys like Durl Wanger who he's not like. Mangala himself is not the most fascinating individual, so a lot of it's just kind of a list of horrible war crimes. Um, but we'll get him one of these days. I know I know the subreddit's crying out for Mangala, and eventually <laughs> I am Jesus. going to show them why they don't want what they think they want. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. What no one's going to have created. a good time with this episode. <laughs> um, it the, is, the it, it, that is Mangala. weird. The people are demanding Mangala. Got a lot of Mangala stands in the audience who can't wait to get their Mangala cue out. Um, got a Mangala pill. Oh, nope, 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 nope. That was a nope, mistake. That, that was a mistake. No, nope, nope. that was a mistake. Ah, mm. let's move it on. Let's move it on. So Mangala. Uh, one report from a German Paraguayan who was in country at the time says that Mangala in 1959 made a, sa- a living in Paraguay as a salesman for a manure spreading business. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Post-war Nazi careers are always like <laughs> so why, weird. Why did they make them do shit? Like mm-hmm. if, if you're just fucking like put them in a hotel or something. Like the, these comedy fucking jobs. Yeah, no, they're making money. The guy who claimed this told Alex Shumatov, I didn't know he was a doctor and we talked about business and never the war. I figured he didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Maybe he probably did. I see. He's probably a <laughs> fucked up saying he'd uh, yeah, love to talk about that Probably didn't want to talk about the war. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. some reports do allege that Stressner and Mengele were close friends also and knew each other well. I have not come across any convincing evidence of this, but he certainly, it's almost certain that Mengele traveled through and spent time in Paraguay. He gets citizenship at one point in time um so it's certainly possible that he and stressner had a degree of social interactions together now that's all pretty bad james when you are smuggling <laughs> dr joseph mengel at a yeah. safety that's a bad thing to do that's that's <laughs> high up on the list of least forgivable things and i'm i'm very pro smuggling but not if you're smuggling nazis you yeah. know fentanyl totally fine Old electronics that you stole from people's cars. Great. Catalytic mm-hmm. converters. Oh, excellent. Based. Yeah, copper. But I not, saw some guys doing some chopper today. I was really proud of them. Mm-hmm. Exactly. We need we need we need the smuggling community to come together against smuggling Joseph Mangala places. Mm-hmm. Look, not even once, folks. Not even once. Anyway. The government's tolerance of Nazis led the fairly small Paraguayan Jewish population to have some awkward experiences after World War II. And this is where things get very weird, James. This is a really odd little story I've got for you. I I found a (laughs) peculiar but unique account of life in Stressner's Paraguay written by a person who at the time was a young boy named Michael Caine. Now, (laughs) not that Michael Caine. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) This Michael Caine is basically a fascist. Um, Yeah, and he, he grew up in... This is so weird. The guy I found this in like this guy's blog. He's just like writing about his time as a little boy in Stressner's Paraguay. Yeah. He he grew up in the UK in a peace church called the Bruderhof, which was part of a network of pacifist Anabaptist religious communities that had started spreading out from Germany in 1920. Now, Michael's like three, I think, in 1941, when his family has to flee the UK. When when the war breaks out, the UK puts Germans in concentration camps. Yeah. Now Nicer ones than the German concentration camps, it must be said. But that's why his family leaves. They're like, this is not, it seems like maybe being German in the UK in 1941 yeah, is an ideal. We might want to bounce. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, unless you're, the, unless you're the monarch, of course, in which case. Unless you, yeah, unless you are the monarch. So his family flees the UK for the only country that will accept their peace church during the war years, which is Paraguay. Michael's recollections are on his website and 
I have not looked into the Bruderhof a lot. It is, again, it's like a pacifist Anabaptist network of religious communities. Michael claims that he suffered terrible sexual abuse and paints a picture of the Bruderhof in Paraguay as a cult. Entirely possible this is true. It would not be out of line with a lot of similar movements. I have no particular reason to doubt him on this. We will be using Michael's account today because it provides some context on how German Jewish and the German Nazi diaspora communicated, which is an interesting thing, right? That you have these Jewish people who have fled to Paraguay and these Nazis who have fled to Paraguay. And because they're all German, they wind up like involved with each other sometimes. (laughs) And that is awkward with a brick. (laughs) (laughs) That would be, uh, and again, Michael, he is writing as an adult about his experiences as a child in this like expat community. The same bar, he's talking about like a bar that he was brought to as a kid for like a, a business deal. The same br- bar used to be owned by Schwarzel. His real name was Emil Wolf, a German Jew. And his place was used for years by Nazis and Jews who were all involved in business and all of them good friends. As a 14-year-old, the Bruderhof put me to work in Asuncion where they bought a new house in Vulgicio Moreno. They rented a large house in Independencia Naciona, two doors down from Wolf. I went to Schwarzel's bar with Alfred, a brother from the Bruderhof who wanted a drink of beer but had no money. But I did, so we went together. Soon, Schwarzel approached me for some business in wood-turned products that the Bruderhof was selling. That's how I became a good friend of Schwarzel. With Jews, the key to a good friendship is money. When oh, no. I came round... Oh, dear. When I- <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Oh, no. Do we want to keep reading, Robert? <laughs> yeah, one last sentence. When I came round to Schwarzel's with wooden articles, he called me Weinachtschman, and I called him Saujud. Now... I looked these nicknames up because I was like, what kind of nicknames do (laughs) basically a Nazi boy and a Jewish boy come up with for each other? Weinachtschman basically means Santa Claus. Uh, So that's the Jewish guy is calling him Santa Claus, right? Uh, Because he's buying, I think because he's buying him a beer. And Saujud, that nickname, which is this kid's nickname for his, this, his Jewish friend comes from the term Judensau, which is a oh, medieval no. racial caricature that depicts Jewish children suckling at the teats of the yep. pig. It is a racial slur. Um, so like his friend is like, Hey, Santa Claus. And he's like, Hey, slur, <laughs> like, Hey, racial slur, buddy. Um, uh, awkward. Look, uh, yeah, ju- th- yeah, yeah. I, I, I would love to find, I haven't found really any other accounts of like, the complicated interactions of the Jewish diaspora German community in Paraguay and the Nazi. I, I assume this happened yeah. in places like Argentina, too. Um, it's a fascinating topic. I would love to read more on the matter. Hopefully, I'll find something else at some point. I just kind of just accidentally phenomenal. stumbled into this. Yeah. The shit that people will put on the internet without being mm-hmm. forced to. Like, you could mm-hmm. not send me to Guantanamo Bay if I had been, <laughs> if I had been giving my friends slur nicknames and get yeah. it out of me. But this guy's just apparently popped it out on the internet for the world to see. <laughs> I mean, this I, I don't entirely know what's happening with the fascist Michael Caine, yeah. but he he's it, it's his his blog is a real one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a time when uh, yeah, Boomers were blogging and yeah, it's a uh, powerful thing, powerful hmm. insight into the brain. S- speaking of fascist Michael Caine, do you know what the non-fascist Michael Caine loves? Uh, blowing the doors off things. Is that is that a thing that Michael Caine did a lot of? Is that the Michael Caine, isn't it? In uh, what's it called? Uh, fuck, he's in a lot film. of stuff. He's Michael Caine. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was in the Batman movies. He's Alfred. I think so. Does he blow the doors off of something? Oh, really? I don't know. I haven't. In the in the Italian job, is that not oh, Michael Caine? Oh, 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 yeah. I think that is it. My that is Michael Caine. It's been yeah, a long time yeah, since I've seen you. the Italian Fucking job. Hell, I had a moment there. I was worried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is this is good Michael Caine content. This is an mm-hmm. episode rich with Michael's Caine. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, anyway, that was a bit of a digression, but I just found it too interesting yeah. to not include. No, um, fascinating. This must have happened in a lot of other countries too. This like the German. Jewish diaspora and the German Nazi diaspora having some forms of interaction with each other. I would love to read more about that. I just don't know. I haven't. I haven't run into much else. But yeah, it's a whole 
whole thing. And it gives you an idea of the kind of peculiar bedfellows that exist under Stressner's regime. Um, the main reason that I found Michael's story, though, is that it provides a rare, direct, personal account of the man that Alfredo Stressner trusted to maintain his secret torture police, um, who were his okay. primary instrument of maintaining power. And this man was named Pastor Miliciades Coronel. Born in August of 1919, Coronel worked for the Education and Culture Ministry. When Stressner came to power, he was like part of the Department of Education. And then Stressner's like, no, no, you seem like more of a torture guy to me. I'm going to put you in charge <laughs> of my torture, de my torture department. Um, <laughs> Coronel was noted to be an obsessive bureaucrat. He loves paperwork. Part of what we know so much about this guy is every arrest and every torture that they do is documented. Every surveilled dissident is recorded and filed away. But he's not just a paperwork guy. He likes to get down there and get his hands dirty. In 1975, when his forces arrested the secretary of the Paraguayan Communist Party, Pastor Coronel had him dismembered by chainsaw while he watched. That is, Oof. yeah, uh, we don't come into enough chainsaw killings in this show, but there we go. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, <laughs> it's always good yeah. to break new ground when it comes yeah, he, to like, state violence. Yeah, no, it's nice. He's like a Robert Rodriguez villain, this guy. So Coronel mm -hmm. is a dedicated student of torture. He practiced it himself, but he was also a keen admirer of the world's greatest torture experts at the time, which was the U.S. police. Now, we know that the <laughs> FBI sent him friendly letters as well as books on law enforcement. Like the, the director <laughs> of the FBI is like sending this guy like textbooks to be like, here you go. This will help you make your torture police. Don't worry. We know all about it. Uh, we also know that through Operation Condor, the FBI FBI kept abreast of whenever Paraguayan dissidents would pop up in surrounding countries that had right-wing dictatorships allied with the U.S., uh, which at this point was all of Paraguay's neighbors. This brings me to the 1958 story of Gladys Sanaman and Augustin Guibaro. They were physicians in the capital who refused to falsify an autopsy report to claim a victim of Coronel's police had died of natural causes. Instead, Dr. Sanaman took the corpse to a class in her medical school and performed the autopsy in front of her students so that there would be people who knew what had happened to this man it was just the only thing she could think of to do to make sure that the truth got out like if i write anything about this they will purge it so i am going to autopsy this murder victim in front of my students so they see what our government's doing uh very sensibly she and her husband fled the country for brazil um now, they're in Brazil for a little while before the Brazilian military seizes power, uh, and so then they have to flee Brazil, and the next place they move, Argentina, falls to a U.S.-backed military dictatorship in 1976. This gives you an idea of, like, how tough it is to be any kind of dissident in South America at this time, right? They're, like, running as fast as they can, always just ahead of the next U.S.-backed military coup. And I'm going to quote from the New York Times here. Hours after the coup, the Argentine police abducted Dr. Sanaman and tortured her at the Escuela Mecanisa in Buenos Aires. Dr. Sanaman said she was bound and plunged into a bathtub of vomit and excrement. They accused me of killing a patient in my office, Dr. Sanaman said, calling the charge a total lie. Then the police falsely accused her of selling drugs, she said. A week later, Dr. Sanaman's husband was abducted and tortured as well. Dr. Sanaman landed at the Emboscada Camp for Political Prisoners in Paraguay, where she treated more than 400 fellow prisoners from several South American countries, including women whose husbands had been executed and their children. The women, she said, had been in prison to silence them. Dr. Sanemann and her husband were eventually given asylum in Germany in 1997 after the German government pressed Argentina to bring about their release. The fate of Dr. Goibaru, who also refused to whitewash torture, remained a mystery until the archives were opened. In 1977, he was kidnapped from a street in Misiones, an Argentine town where he had gone to escape the Stresner regime. And, um, you know, he's, he's executed by the regime. He's killed once he gets back. We have some personal accounts of Pastor Coronel's torture tactics as well. Senator Carlos Levy Ruffinelli was the leader of the Liberal Party, a controlled opposition party Stressner allowed to exist to provide the illusion of democracy. Um, and even though this was he, you know, he's letting this guy basically live to be controlled op or to be opposition, he still arrests him 19 times and has him tortured six times. Um, <laughs> that guy, here's what, that is uh, a bold dude just just yes. keep coming back for more he, he is a brave man uh, yeah, and i'm going to yeah. quote from him now talking about his experiences under coronel's torturers most of the time i did not know what they wanted they did not even know what they wanted but when they put the needles under your fingernails you tell them anything you denounce everybody and then they say see you were lying to us all the time now, I found an even more detailed and horrific account of pastor coronel's jails in a bbc article by simon watts 
Almada came to the attention of the secret police in the early 1970s when he and his wife, Celestina, were working as teachers in a school where they had set up on the outskirts of Asuncion. Their politics were left-wing, and they campaigned for better salaries and working conditions for teachers, and for changes to the curriculum. One evening, the secret police came for him. After 30 days of interrogation, Almada was officially classified as an intellectual terrorist and an ignoramus. He was sent to the infamous Emboscada open-air prison, where he was held for three years. Celestina died shortly after Almada's arrest in what the police said was a suicide. Almada has always believed she died because police played her recordings of him being tortured. The telephone was used as an instrument of psychological torture, he says. For eight days, they made her listen systematically to everything that happened to me. Then they sent her my bloodied clothing. Finally, they called her one night and said, The subversive teacher is dead. Come and get his body. She died of a heart attack, he says. She died of grief. Uh, And again, all of this is based on teachings that the FBI handed down to Coronel and his police. They sent trainers. The CIA sent trainers. Like, U.S. cops taught Coronel's cops how to do all this. None of this was, you know, separate from American politics in Latin America at the time. Yeah, there are people alive today whose taxes help to pay for that, so that's great. Anyway, anyway, to the FBI agents listening, uh, I hope you enjoyed this proud recitation of your history here. (laughs) What a glorious Um, institution. So thanks to those now open archives, uh, we also know that Stressner, after he took power, a U.S. military colonel named Robert Terry, T-H-E-I-R-R-Y, he lived in Texas, actually came to Paraguay to put together a lot of the basic structure of Stressner's police state as part of a broader U.S. plan to crack down on left-wing organizing in the entire region. The FBI handled a lot of the grunt work. On one occasion, a dissident from Pinochet's regime in Chile fled to Paraguay. He was arrested and interrogated by Coronel's men. They then called up the FBI, who interrogated Chilean relatives of the dissident who were living in the United States, and in handed that information to Pinochet, who disappeared the dissident once he'd been handed over. Um, This is the way things worked uh, in Latin America, much of it. Clarence Kelly, who was head of the FBI at the time, sent Coronel a Christmas letter wishing him, quote, a truly joyous Christmas and a new year filled with all the good things you so richly deserve. Good good guys. Jesus Christ. Good guys. Now, earlier I read you a quote from that weird Michael Caine guy's blog. Um, I decided to highlight some of this kind of a Nazi's recollections because as a child, he lived near Pastor Coronel and he spent time with the man. And there's not a lot of context on this guy. So he's some of like the only evidence I've found about what Stressner's chief torturer was like as a person. And this is kind of interesting. On this day, I first met Pastor Coronel. He was about five years older than me. His t- uncle Don and rather mayor, uh, or rather Mayor Coronel owned a neighboring Estancia ranch to the Bruderhof. His Estancia was called San Martin. In Paraguay, landowners like to give themselves military titles for importance, hence the mayor title. <laughs> mayor Coronel habitually carried a gun. He must have read the little bread book by Chairman Mao, where on it says page 48, the power of the people comes out of the barrel of a gun. For this reason, he was highly respected or feared, depending on your language. It was him who let me shoot his Colt 45 revolver for the first time in my life. The recoil hurt my thumb. This made all the Paraguayan onlookers laugh really loud. <laughs> oh, man, this, this kind of prose is really a gift to the yeah, internet. It, it's given it's, us it's, it's amazing. Like it. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> you legitimately never know what this fuck is going to come know. up with next. I know. It's it's this man is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, just a stream of consciousness. Yeah, it's unedited. It's, it's one of those little gifts that you um you come across when you're doing a deep enough dive. That's just like, yeah. No one, okay. no one would put this in a scholarly because, like, I can't verify any of this, but I'm not not going to put it in a podcast. It's just no. too. It's just too incredible. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, a, it's a hidden gem of the. Like, this guy uh, now is commenting on Facebook shit about how he. I don't. <laughs> powerfully divorced vibe. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised that Michael Caine grew up to be the most divorced man on the internet. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. hates his children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, perfect. Uh, ah, yeah. yes. Nom, 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 nom. Give it all to me, James. That's <laughs> that's what I love the internet for. Yeah, yeah. This is the mm. true goal. So, back to Paraguay. 
Um, it has always been pretty deeply fucked from an economic justice point of view. Today it actually has, fun fact, James, the most mm -hmm. unequal land distribution of any nation on Earth. 90% uh, wow. of its land is owned by 12,000 people. Now, Jesus Christ, th that's not great. This state of affairs actually started because of the War of the Triple Alliance, which left most Paraguayans dead and their land up for grabs, right? There's a lot of land that there's no one alive left <laughs> to own. no one left. Yeah. yeah. And in the wake of that calamity, the next dictators basically sold everything that wasn't nailed down, all these dead people's land, to fund rebuilding and to fund themselves. And during this period, 32 firms purchased almost half of the country. Um, one Spanish Jesus. businessman purchased 7 million hectares, which is more than a full Ireland of private property. Um, <sighs> yeah, that's, that's yeah, too wow. much land that for is... a person to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what yeah. needs that much. What yeah. was he doing with but, it all? There's a, a brisk debate to be had about the extent to private property. No <laughs> yeah. one should be able yeah. to own an Ireland. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's too much. <laughs> uh, the consequences of this led directly to a situation where all wealth in Paraguay was determined by land ownership because land gave one the ability to exploit minerals or other natural resources or at least charge rent. When Stressner came to power, the first person he killed was a government official tasked with carrying out a land reform policy to remedy this inequality. That is the first guy he has murdered, is this guy doing the land reform. <laughs> Great. And yeah, I'm going to quote next from an article in Earthsight. As part of these clientelist networks, Stressner divided what remained of public land among his allies. Eight million hectares were given away or sold at negligible prices to army generals and Colorado grandees. This land was ostensibly destined for small-scale farmers as part of a program of agrarian reform, and so has come to be, be known as Las Tierras Malhabitas, the ill-gotten lands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's a good story. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No problems yeah. there at all. He started off on a great note, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. So this leads to a pretty long-running series of massacres of what are called campesinos, who are tenant farmers attempting to protest sure. for land reform. Um, for Stressner, this also forms a crucial part of the network of bribery and other way-looking that powers his dictatorship. To get military officers on his side, he hands out high-level positions in state monopolies or land. And then he also has Pastor Coronel's secret police stand aside and ignore the illegal trade and contraband so that they can make a shitload of money smuggling stuff into the country. Peter Lambert writes of this, Contraband, often quoted as the price of peace and involving the vast majority of officials through their control of the frontier zones, guaranteed the complicity of the military establishment and the maintenance of a lucrative status quo. In the words of Eduardo Galeano, the generals fill their pockets and hatch no plots. So basically, he takes, he kills the guy who is responsible for redistributing land to the peasants. He takes all this land, he gives it to his generals, particularly land on the borders, which they then use in order to carry out, like, basically create smuggling networks, right? To bring products in that are not taxed. And this is fucked up. Um, it's a mixed bag yeah. for much of the population because one thing this does is that you can actually get a lot of shit cheaper in Paraguay than you can in like the US where it's being made. Like TVs are cheaper there and shit for a while because it's like no taxes and everyone in the government understands part of why we don't, we're not dealing with any uprisings right now is that like people can get cheap TVs and the money from those cheap TVs bribes the generals not to upset the apple cart, you know? It's a pretty intelligent system. It's evil, but it's smart, right? Right. How yeah. are you funding your your state though if if, if people aren't paying taxes and uh well, a lot of people aren't paying taxes. You do have like a shit. I mean, part. I mean, honestly, the, the answer, CIA, like, James, money, is the CIA, right? Like yeah, he's great, getting great. Uh, eventually like, tens yeah. of millions of dollars from the United States. <laughs> Utopian yeah. socialism. Um, but it's a perfect system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what oh, if the mate. CIA could fund civic programs here to rebuild roads and bridges? Don't even think about it, Robert. Nope. <laughs> Dropping in CIA agents to like <laughs> clean up that part. <laughs> town in Ohio that the train just <laughs> nuked. It's torturing the, uh, uh, the dude who runs Norfolk mm -hmm. Southern. Yeah, backing a dictator in Ohio, but then also cleaning up the land. It's a mixed bag in Ohio. Yeah, yeah. You half the population's been tortured to death, but the sea's cleaner now. 
Um, let's see. It's Ohio. What am I yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, the so, Ohio Ocean. Yeah, the, o- the Ohio <laughs> Ocean, we call it. <laughs> it's where the land <laughs> so, sharks come from. <laughs> we've talked a good amount about the torture and murder, Stressner's chief attack dog, pastor. And by the way, pastor's not like a religious term. It's like, I think, sorry, pastor is what I should be saying. But you know me in pronunciations. It's his first name is pastor. Um... Pastor Coronel carried out. But what's perhaps more interesting is how relatively rarely he needed to do this. The early years of the Stresner regime established such a baseline of terror that Paraguayan civil society was comprehensively beaten down. Um, And it had been pretty beaten down earlier, right? So kind of what happens after he takes power is most people are like, yeah, man, he sucks, but we're not dealing with the civil war every year. And like, you know, the corruption at least means cheap TVs. So why don't we just give up on politics, right? Yeah. Like that's kind of, that's how Lambert, Lambert, that's how Lambert kind of describes what happens to the people. And he he calls this the institutionalization of repression and defines that as a demobilization of civil society due to a perception that politics is only the domain of soldiers and the leaders who control them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't have like uh, if civil society is like non-state actors who make demands of the state. Like, what the fuck is yeah. the point in making demands yeah. of the state when yeah, either it changes every five minutes or it kills you? Exactly. And I'm going to read another quote from Lambert here that makes this point. To a large extent, the regime succeeded in not only demobilizing, the, but depoliticizing civil society, destroying not only the organizational ability of the opposition, but more importantly, the capacity to question, to analyze, and to criticize. The repression and co-option, and co-option of nascent opposition led to an apparent acceptance of the status quo, a cynicism toward politics, a disinterest in what was seen as an area reserved for elites and prohibited to the masses. And to be fair, the stability that Stressner brings with him makes it easy for the people who aren't being targeted by the government to feel this way. Uh, Regular people are benefiting from this situation in a lot of ways. And the 1970s see an economic explosion as Paraguay finally recovers from both the Chaco War and its decades of instability. For a while, it has the highest growth rate of any South American country. And a lot of this is due to the fact that there's a, a joint Brazilian Paraguayan project to create a massive hydroelectric dam in Itaipu. Today, I believe the Itaipu dam is still the most productive hydroelectric power uh, project on the planet. Like, it's a pretty good idea to have this dam there. (laughs) Um, You know, not that that's up to Stressner, but he green lights it. And massive corruption ensures that Paraguayan industry, like, this is part of the problem is that, like, this is a great thing to have in your country, like this incredibly productive power dam. They have a contract basically with Brazil where they split the power 50-50 and Brazil like funds the construction. Um, but because of massive corruption, none of the 50% of a typo's power that's supposed to go to Paraguay actually goes towards, you know, building an industrial base or doing anything to improve the economy. Um So the project temporarily brings an economic boom because so many Paraguayans are working on it, but they're not going to actually use the resources that it generates to improve the economy in any meaningful way, um, which is going to be a problem for everybody in a little bit here. Paraguay's boom years are also helped by regular infusions of cash from the United States and the IMF to the eventual tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. In exchange, Stressner keeps Paraguay as a compliant and stress-free part of Operation Condor. The CIA never needs to send in black ops teams to the country or fund paramilitary death squads. There's no grinding left-wing insurgency that threatens the stability of the government. The fact that Stressner was generally good for U.S. policy aims and the undeniable fact that life under his rule was at least more stable than life under previous dictators led some in the international community to call him a good dictator. George Landau, a U.S. ambassador to the country, called Alfredo benign as dictatorships go. Oh, God, there it is. Yeah, Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure the teachers being soaked in shit and then murdered are. uh, Yeah, this is benign, basically, as dictatorships (laughs) go. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you know, televisions uh, are cheap what are you gonna do it's nice what, what of the things fucking george landau says is that well you know pr- political prisoners in uh in paraguay generally get out of prison alive as long as they have powerful friends no oh, yeah great well that's uh, not a problem uh, then, that's good it? we're good yeah, yeah, yeah no yeah, yeah, yeah thank fine. you i was i was worried we were complicit yeah. in nightmarish evil again but yeah. you know what it's good we're fine. Shining city on a hill shit, as always. 
<laughs> the United I, States. <laughs> I am at the ghost of George Washington <laughs> speaking on a mountain above D.C. Yeah, <laughs> we will build a nation where political prisoners sometimes get out of prison if their friends are powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one of the things that they didn't put on my becoming an American test. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, yeah. that's one of those like little quotes they write in your passport book. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, you know what else winds up written in your passport book Uh, is it corporations yeah I mean kind of Uh, how many piles of gold you've bought if you have enough gold you don't even need a passport Sophie you know what innovative I like it thank Mm -hmm. you Ah, we're back. Mm -hmm. We're all having a good time. Everybody's happy. The story's Mm -hmm. happy. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So George Landau, our our good friend, the U.S. ambassador to Paraguay for a while, (laughs) claims that Stressner repeatedly complained in the late 70s that he was tired of ruling and that he wanted to retire to a life of fishing and hunting, but that (laughs) Paraguay needed him. Landau claimed he believed, as most dictators do, that he was absolutely irreplaceable. He talked himself into a sense of duty. Now, that's horseshit. <laughs> Sorry. Hmm. Where's What's Landau? Actually... Where's he writing this? Like, is he just like doing op Yeah, in like or... Asuncion. Yeah, he's like, he's like, I think this is like, yeah, while he's, he's uh, uh, probably like, oh, after, yeah. I think I he leaves in 79. And shit. Yeah. So, um, I believe that, and other sources I found will argue that Stressner basically gets addicted to total power. Yeah. And it kind of loses the ability to conceive of anyone else making decisions about his country. Um, it is interesting to read accounts like Landau's by Americans who talked to Stressner do- during this period because, like, everyone in Paraguay, like all of the people in his cabinet, every other leader, has to treat him as kind of a cross between, like, God and the devil because his whim can destroy their lives, right? right? So no one can talk to him honestly. But American soldiers and diplomats like are safe right like you you can actually have a conversation with stressner because like yeah. he's not he's not gonna fuck up the money right he's not an idiot um so take this in taking this into account i found a letter to the editor of national review by a former u.s soldier who traveled to paraguay for work during stressner's time in office that i found really interesting in very good English, he said, I am President Alfredo Stressner, and I would like to thank you for showing us your aircraft. Since I am in my country, custom requires that I continue this conversation in Spanish with my interpreter, which he did. His interpreter was far less fluent in English than the leader. We gave him a tour of the airplane and answered all his questions about it. Then he philosophized for a few minutes. We never understood why. The remark that has struck with me to this day was, I am sure you have heard that I am a dictator. That is true, but I am a benevolent dictator, which my country needs. We are a backward country, and my people are not ready for democracy. (laughs) We wisely made no comment on the remark, and shortly after, we launched for a return flight to the Canal Zone. (laughs) Jesus Um, Christ. Yeah, and it's interesting, because this guy, is he's literally writing to the editor of National Review. I'm going to assume this serviceman is pretty conservative. But he ends his letter by noting, we knew very well even then there was nothing benevolent about Stressner's dictatorship, which is honestly, which is more honest than George Landau was willing yeah, to be. Sure. Yeah. yeah, this guy's not cut out for a career in foreign yeah. service. So no, good. no, no. What so, I, imagine you're there showing him your airplane, just being mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm glad that we're sharing our military assets yeah, with this piece yeah. of shit boomer. <laughs> I feel good about my service today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I signed up to defend uh, this country. God willing. As the 1980s dawned, Alfredo's power was at its apparent height from the New York Times. President Stressner was never one for understatement. His name, written in neon, flashed nightly over the Asuncion cityscape during his reign. And his face was plastered... He's a man of the times. He's he's adopted neon. (laughs) Yeah, he's ready for the Reagan years. Um, His face was plastered daily in the newspapers and on television. He was known for turning up in his powder blue military uniform every Thursday at the general staff headquarters of the armed forces. John Vinicure, writing in the New York Times magazine in 1984, offered this snapshot of Paraguay as its army Goose stepped down the boulevards to celebrate General Stressner's 30 years in power. A continual state of siege over the entire period that literally places the president above the law, people with occasionally uncontrollable urges to fall into rivers or jump from planes with their arms and legs bound, serenades in front of the presidential palace featuring the ever-popular Forward, My General, and Congratulations, My Great Friend. Foreign (laughs) thieves, brutes and madmen hidden at a price, an economy administered so corruptly it is officially explained away as the cost of peace, a United Nations voting record on so-called key issues more favorable to the United States than 
than any other ally, a party newspaper that prints six four-page color pictures of the general every day. Jesus Christ. <laughs> what a great what a country. Po- Things yeah, are going well. <laughs> what a powerful image. Anytime you've got goose-stepping military and anyone in power yeah. for 30 years, I should set off some alarm bells. Yeah. Now, appearances can be deceiving, James, because when the construction of the Itaipu Dam stopped in 1981, that just so happened to occur at the same time as a global collapse in the value of cotton and soya bean, which were Paraguay's two biggest crops. So because uh, due to rampant corruption, none of this power generated by Itaipu is being used to like help them create a better industrial base, Paraguay's economy takes a long walk off a short pier at this point in time. The balance of payments and deficit for Paraguay gets so bad that Stressner is finally forced to abandon his fixed rate for the currency. Um, uh. Inflation rises sh- sharply, and with it comes the first stirrings of resistance to his regime. Now, in addition to the fact that the economy has taken a shit, Stressner's an old man at this point. His health troubles him, and he's forced to hand over more and more control to his underlings, like Pastor Coronel, who begins actively scheming to replace him. To cope with the stress, Alfredo increasingly gravitates to the only hobby that makes it all better. James, what do you do when you're stressed out? How do you chill out? I I go for bike rides. I go rock climbing. Okay, interesting. I camp. Is, is, are those his favorite activities too? I no, make spoons. Uh, you know, wooden spoons. It, 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 that's interesting. Those are all great hobbies, James. Uh, Alfredo takes a mm-hmm. slightly different route. He gets really involved in child sex trafficking. Um, oh, so, okay. Yep. <laughs> I'm yeah. gonna read a right. I'm gonna read a, yeah. a quote. Different kind Al- of spooning to the kind, yeah. of, the kind of spooning oh, I enjoy. Oh, oh boy, <laughs> I'm gonna quote from Alex Shumatov from Vanity Fair. <laughs> Stressner was no doubt aware of the inevitable waning of his powers, and his solution to the problem seems to have been schoolgirls, muchachitas. Oh, no. They were his elixir. Maybe he mm. thought that the intercambio de hormonas would keep him young. What? He wasn't alone in his predilection for this therapy. His friend Peron, who liked boys as well, consoled himself with a 14-year-old mm. after the death of Evita. In the opinion of Stressner's family surgeon, Manuel Riveros, there was nothing abnormal about an old man having a soft spot for... Nymphets. This is an article from the <laughs> 80s in Vanity Fair. So yeah, the writer's yeah. a bastard too. Look, let's yeah. not be wrong here. <laughs> Youth wow. is contagious, he told me. Trujillo crossed the streets of Santo Domingo looking for girls. Bocasa cruised the streets of Bangui. Stressner cruised the streets of Asuncion. It went with the turf. The girls were Don Alfredo's draw de signor. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it's not very good. Alex Shumatov is a prestige magazine journalist writing in the 1980s. So he's a kind of gross guy in some ways. <laughs> yes, yes, this guy's and, an extreme fucking <laughs> creep. Oh, I I don't even start it, James. Oh, God. Here's yeah, Alex on. again. G- g- give me more of his pay on to pedophilia. <laughs> It is hard not to notice the schoolgirls, slender, tan, mestiza beauties budding in their white uniforms, who pour into the streets of Asuncion at noon. After a long morning, Stressner would park near one of the schools and watch them come out. When he had made his pick, his aides would find out who the girl was and approach the parents with an offer of cash or real estate. If all else failed, the girl was kidnapped and given an injection that made her more cooperative. If she got pregnant, she was sent to the best (laughs) hospital and treated by the best doctors. How many children the Tyrannosaurus produced is unknown but there are thought to be many i am feeling physically unwell <clears throat> so that's fucked up yeah and this is uh, obviously if you are this guy reporting for a huge magazine on this this is critical stuff to report on you don't yeah. need to describe how attractive the schoolgirls are alex <laughs> yeah. that's bad yeah. not, that makes me think you're a I monster too that yeah. story <laughs> wildly inappropriate terrible wow, wow. so yeah Jesus Christ. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. One of the people procuring children for the dictator was Colonel Leopoldo Perrier, who scoured the countryside for eight to 12 year old peasant girls and eight? brought, yeah. Yep. He, Fuck he, me. Very young. Um, and he would bring them to safe houses in suburban like neighborhoods that had playgrounds so that they would be amused while they waited for the general. Duh, duh, um, that's like the worst fuck, detail yeah, for whatever man, reason. Fucking hell. Um, Ooh, if you've yeah. got a slide for your girlfriends, like, you, yep. yeah, you're doing it wrong. I'm going to read another very rough two sentences from that Vanity right. Fair article. I'm bracing. One of Stressner's conquests was the 15-year-old daughter of the head of the national cement industry. As part of the seductions, she and her brother got a trip to Disney World. 
Oh man. Oh, good hell. Now that that is that is dark. That is rough. Yeah. This story was first broken by Jack Anderson in the Washington Post in 1977, who yeah. I'm fair, I, from what I recall of his article, does not write anything creepy <laughs> about these children. <laughs> um, yeah. He, like, bases his article off of an interview he conducts with a woman named Melina Ashwell. And Melina is the daughter of a Paraguayan official stationed in Washington, D.C., who tells him that two years earlier in 75, back in the Capitol, they'd been having lunch with a colleague when they were called over to the mansion next door, where they saw the unconscious bodies of two eight year old girls Aww. and one nine year old girl who were both bleeding between their legs. Ashwell called the police, but they had, like, the police show up, but they leave immediately because somebody points out that the house is owned by Colonel Perrier. The house is apparently a brothel frequented by the dictator himself. Um, and she calls, uh, like, you know, once the police leave, she calls a local journalist and tries to give him the story before she goes to the post. But the journalist she tells this all to, the Paraguayan journalist, gets arrested for communism and a raid of his house turns up the text of her interview. So she gets tortured for three days. She's only saved because her dad is influential. When Anderson publishes this story, wheels start turning in the Carter White House. And thankfully, Carter is not unwilling to back dictators as he does in El Salvador yeah. during this period of time. But this is far too much for, for Jimmy Carter. Um, and the United States cuts aid to um, Stressner's dictatorship. Um, now, <clears throat> Reagan winds up in the office very shortly thereafter. And Reagan's like... Oh, we have no problem supporting a pedophile yeah, yeah. with military. Oh, We're doing this totally what? fine. Yeah. <laughs> Ronald Reagan but, switches that policy right back. They do lose out on money during this period where the economy is also in the shitter, and that creates problems. It weakens Stressner's regime, right? It's one of the things that contributes to the, the weakening of his regime. By 1982, campesinos who lost their job, or in 1982, campesinos who'd lost their jobs when the dam was finished started to protest again for land reform. This got in the way of the dreams of Stressner's cabinet members and military officers. Villages were declared centers of delinquency and subversion and forcibly evacuated. The peasantry began to desert Stressner as a result. By the late 1980s, the general was sick enough that he could no longer fully control his regime. He'd hoped one of his sons would take over for him, but one of them was an alcoholic and the other was gay, and neither of them had the wherewithal to politic their way through Stressner's cabinet. On February 3rd, General Andres Rodriguez, a close re relative of the dictator by marriage, executed a violent coup against Stressner. There's an eight-hour gunfight. Stressner barely gets away in, like, a limousine from the gunfight. But, like, there's enough resistance um, that, like, he, uh, he is able to escape and keep his own life. But his troops are not able to stop the soldiers loyal to Rodriguez from taking the capital. By the way, Rodriguez is married to his his daughter. Um, he's like his son-in-law too. Right. So cool. Stressner is able to negotiate the safe a safe surrender of power, um, and he and his household are granted you know the ability to leave the country. So he survives losing power, which is again rules for thirty five years. Yeah, gets out yeah. alive. Very rare story in the annals of dictatorships. Um, he had initially hoped to land in Florida because he owned several houses in Florida. <laughs> um, <laughs> the traditional resting place of retired yeah. dictators. He feared, though, being tried for his crimes. And so when the right-wing military government of Brazil offered him sanctuary, he took it. He spent the last 17 years of his life there, living in comfort until the age of 93. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. A, a yeah. terrible... Terrible Disappointing monster that he didn't never pays violently. for his crimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was really rooting for Rodriguez there to... Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah put it would have been good him. if he'd gotten the old Mussolini. Um, yeah, that would... Yeah, we'd have loved yeah. to see that. Yeah. Or if they did him like Gaddafi, but... Yeah, no, put him up as a fucking pinata for eight-year-old girls to... Uh, Alas, uh, he lives out his life on the beaches of Brazil. Um, yeah. So, you know... That's a good story. Yeah, that in many ways not, uh, yeah. but it's, mm. it is a story. That's undeniable. Mm -hmm. You know what yeah. else is undeniable, James? Uh, How brutal the ending of this fucking podcast was? Yeah, well, that was Boy, properly that was really fucking not gonna, terrible, Robert. No, I really did backload the, oh the worst. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you, uh, that fucking Disneyland shit is, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, yeah that, it's pretty rough. You said yeah, some yeah. really horrible things on yeah. this I podcast. I read some really horrible wow. things. 
That yes. Was, yeah. That was next yeah. level dark. Uh, I'm, I'm glad. You, I'm glad you gave like a slight warning to people because that's just yeah, yeah. That was some particularly dark shit. <sighs> that is some particularly dark shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. James. Was- Jay, Robert, <laughs> do you have anything to plug? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Now that we've talked about child sexual abuse, uh, that, that, that's uh, you know, uh, we've got another podcast uh, in which we much more rarely talk about child sex abuse, uh, which is you know. So if that's something you don't want to hear about, you can uh, listen to it. Could yeah. happen here. It's sometimes with me, sometimes oh, good. with Robert and Sophie. <sighs> We're going to put that in our vulture write up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll go soaring up the rankings. Yeah. Soaring. Rarely discusses child sex abuse. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good so, uh, yeah, it's a thing we won't talk about. I would like I... to plug the concept of hugging a nice, friendly animal like a dog or a cat. Yeah. And, defi- and there definitely you go. not uh, Phil. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's probably he's decayed been, at this point. He's been dropped yeah. thanks to yeah, yeah. If you're going to pause, yo, if you're going to hug an animal, like you know, really make sure you're in a stable stance. Make sure the animal to, wants to hug contact. you back. Yeah, yeah. Don't kidnap animals. And don't let your animal anywhere near Phil. De- I mean, by <laughs> <laughs> Bill 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 Yeah, Phil de Blasio adopted it posthumously and it's now Phil de Blasio. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, he simply had to at that point. But yeah, Yeah, Robert, Robert. At least pay for its funeral. You you have a book that people can buy. I do. It's called After the Revolution. You can find it at AK Press's website or like Amazon or like bookstores. You can go to a bookstore and you could be like, I would like After the Revolution by Robert Evans. And if they say no... Whatever weapon you're carrying, you know, you can just whip that out and, and you know, create a hostage situation until you get a copy of my book. Or you could request um, it at yeah, your local it, library. Yeah, yeah all, of, all of these are equally yeah. valid options. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just, out. I, I like, I, my brain is on that photo of Phil de Blasio dropping Phil the ground. Uh, <laughs> it's very funny. Very funny. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm, I, this, be, this is over. I've yeah. recorded way too yeah, long. Yeah. Goodbye. We're going to go pour one out for Phil. <laughs> we'll pour yeah. one out for Phil. Bye-bye. Bye. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media... Visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.